Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending November 4th, 2017. I'll go in reverse order this time and talk about my lettuce plants, my lettuce garden ahead of time. Looks to me like, at least for the purposes that I am trying to grow it for, it's not going to work out as being a good experiment. I'm not going to throw them away. I'm going to let them keep growing and see when they finally get big enough. But as you can see by the pictures here, this is at the four-week period. And typically everybody else that has shown them on YouTube by the fifth week has been able to start harvesting easily, sometimes even in the fourth week. But by the fifth week, definitely. Well, with week four coming up now and seeing the way the plants look, there's pretty much no chance now. I think I can bring this down to uh, one major factor, the lack of light. And as I've said before, people have suggested grow lights, but that wasn't the purpose of my experiment. My purpose uh, was to make it as simple as possible and not have to set up any kind of elaborate setup whatsoever. Um, not like with uh, having three cats anyway, I could set up any kind of a real elaborate garden anyway without the cats tearing it up. This is the one place that they don't tend to go near is on top of my microwave by the south facing window. And it looks like in my area, being in the Chicagoland area, it's just not practical with all the... Okay, Okay, sorry for that interruption. One of the dogs just ran into the room and my wife chased it down. It's time for them to go out. Uh, first article here is from astronomy.com about the Mars 2020 rover. Now the new 2020 rover is going to have 23 cameras. And uh, yes, they're even going to have cameras to uh, help them watch the landing, help them watch the parachute unfurl and everything like that. Plus, they actually took my suggestion, not that they probably heard it directly from me, but maybe enough people complained about it that they're actually going to have an audio microphone on the cam on the uh, rover this time. So, um, the, because cameras have shrunk in size, increased in quality, and decreased in price over the years, NASA has decided that the rover for its Mars 2020 mission will be decked out with more cameras than any other rover that has come before it. Altogether, the Mars 2020 rover will have 23 cameras that will use they will use to study the Martian atmosphere and the soil, reveal potential hazards and obstacles, create sweeping panoramas, and much, much more. Um, yes, if you can send single photographs instead of stitching them together, it also saves on bandwidth, too, because all these uh, pictures have to be pushed down the line through radio signals and then beamed back to NASA. And before, what they had to do to survey a big area before they decided to go in a different direction was take several pictures and then stitch them together into a panoramic shot now with one of these new cameras they will actually just take one shot uh, of a panoramic picture and they also are improving their compression techniques to be able to send pictures faster too so if you want to get a chance read down in the description below and the links to all the articles I am talking about will be in the uh, description box okay this is from bbcnews.com evidently they have found a big void in the uh, Great Pyramid and they've used it, uh, they found it by using muon detection. What they do with that is cosmic rays usually come in from above, different directions, but they do come in from above. So if you can put this muon detector, or they have three different types of ways they're doing this uh, muography, they call it. If you can put it down below whatever you're trying to get a, a view of uh, with the muons, what you can do is the uh, cosmic rays come in, and they're like little tiny bullets. They don't really interact with anything. They're so small they hardly ever even hit an atom or anything like that. But once in a while they do hit something. And if you've got huge amounts of matter, there's a bigger chance they're going to hit something and then produce these muons um, as a, a subatomic particle just by interacting with the matter. As they hit um, less things or enter a place that's a void or a chamber, there's less interaction, so your muon count would be down a little bit more. So basically what you're doing is you're putting these detectors down below the pyramid or down below the area you want to measure in a, a dense object, and then you're just counting the muons and you're doing density averages. And when you're uh, considering where the cosmic rays are coming from, if they're coming from off to the left, then um, you take the readings there and then you take readings from cosmic rays coming off to the right and in different areas and moving your detector around, you're going to get different levels of muon production. And so where muons are more, where you're producing more muons, they're interacting with more matter because there's more matter there where you're producing less muons. It's because there is missing matter. And so um, it's not really super clear. The resolutions are not really um, super sharp with these things. All it gives you is general ideas. But they believe, and I'll put some pictures up here, um, I'll put the picture up here of the actual where they think the void is. And uh, 
A lot of them are saying that it's not anything going to be a new chamber with uh, all kinds of stuff in it to find uh, treasure and stuff like that. What they think it likely is is it's part of the construction to relieve some of the pressure up above because you have chambers in there that have ceilings and to relieve the pressure on the ceiling they think some of these voids were created for that reason. Uh, and the other thing they, they're going to try to do if they get permission from the Egyptian government is they're going to try to drill a small hole maybe just a few inches wide and snake a little tiny robot in there to be able to see what these uh, voids are all about. So very interesting in there. And my final article, and this is from my friend Bob, 1954 Shadow, it's called Drilling for Muons, and this is from Nautilus.us. Uh, it's, it's a very long article, so um, if you want to read something like a small novella, probably something like about 20, 30 paragraphs, but it's a very interesting article about engineering, uh, drilling holes in the ice, uh, places like Greenland, Antarctica, stuff like that, and uh, searching for neutrinos. But the main thing about this article, and I really like about it, really, as an article itself, is it talks about the fact of not believing what the textbooks tell you, because these scientists that were doing the drilling uh, themselves were not real super knowledgeable. They were trying out new things, and they hadn't read that you're not supposed to do it this way, you're not supposed to do it that way. So by not having that knowledge drilled into their head, they just tried things that were not normal to try, or that probably other scientists that were more knowledgeable, supposedly, than them would have asked them not to try. And believe it or not, they were able to uh, uh, not follow the rules and detect neutrinos. So listen to what it says here. I'll just give you a little example in the very middle, middle of the article, uh, maybe just a little bit past the halfway point. Had he read what the definitive textbook on the optics of water and ice, for example, he would have learned that the absorption length of blue light in pure ice, the distance over which about two-thirds of the light will be absorbed, was about eight meters. That would have been a showstopper. They would have given the photo tubes, they were using these photo tubes to measure, they would have given the photo tubes back to Klein and Ruby and gone home. If Chenikov light had really was, really was absorbed in that short distance, it would take something like two million photo tubes to fill a cubic kilometer of ice, and the tubes alone would have cost six billion. Luckily, the book turned out to be very, very wrong. They obtained an estimate of 18 meters from the Greenland data, and even though it too turned out to be wrong, it was a step in the right direction. It ended up being that light could penetrate even a lot farther, so um, their ability to measure the neutrinos, because you need um, the neutrinos to interact and create a little bit of light to do that if you've ever... Uh, um, I think I've talked before about the Minos experiment that my brother-in-law is running in uh, uh, Fermi Lab in Naperville, Illinois. Well, it's kind of like this. Uh, some of the same techniques they're using too. You have to uh, neutrinos rarely interact, just like muons rarely interact. But when they do, they produce certain wavelengths of light, and you have to be able to observe it. So these scientists, by not following the textbook, uh, or not even knowing what the textbook told them they're supposed to be able to do, um, did it a different way, and uh, didn't end up wasting time. Ended up finding out that they can't actually measure neutrinos. So. Um, it's a really interesting read, and if you read the beginning part of it, too, this one engineer, too, uh, it's kind of funny. He talks about that he's not really into machinery all that much, which is kind of funny for an engineer, but it is a long read, and it's an interesting read, so if you get a chance, I would encourage you to check it out. Nautilus.us, and the link will be down below. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.